The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Syndicate Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by CAPS Managing Editor, Kobus van Staden, joining us on the line as usual from Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, it's been another difficult month looking at the debt situation in Africa. Mali is now the latest country that defaulted on a portion of its debt. $93 million in interest and principal payments since January have gone unpaid. And this is the latest country to have done so. Zambia, of course, last year defaulted on about $43 million of euro bond debt. So there's a lot of questions as to whether or not in this current period, Mali will not be the last country to struggle to repay some of its debts, especially now as we've been talking about in recent editions of the program and in some of the writing that we're doing on the website about the balance of payments problems that a lot of African countries are having right now in terms of severe currency fluctuations that are impacting the ability for countries to service their debts and also to pay for large amounts of imports, in many cases coming from China specifically. We also have this issue right now of a very strong Chinese currency, the RMB. Uh, When I checked today, just before the show, it's at 635 That RMB has been going up uh, in part because of some of the volatility brought into the markets from the war in Ukraine and also news that the Saudi Arabian national oil company Aramco may start to pay for some of its oil in RMB, in yuan. That raises questions if the fact that the RMB increases in value, it does add to the cost of imports for a country like Kenya or Zambia, Zimbabwe and others that are highly dependent on Chinese imports. All of this is kind of matrixed together coming back to this debt question because in countries like Zambia and also in Kenya, the borrowing continues. The ability to pay for it is struggling in many cases, not in all cases, but in some cases. And we really wonder, where does this end? Kobus, you and I have spoken at length since the beginning of the pandemic over the G20's utter failure to take this situation seriously. I mean, they're not even trying anymore. They're just pretending to take it seriously because at one G20 meeting after another, we always go in thinking maybe this will be the time. It's like Lucy in the football. For those of you who know Charlie Brown, Lucy put down the football. Charlie Brown said, this time I'm going to actually kick the football. He goes up. He takes a swipe with his leg to try and kick the football. Lucy takes the ball away. I feel it's the same thing going on with the G20 and debt restructuring. We always have the expectation at these various summits and these finance ministers, central bank minister meetings, and nothing comes of it. Last year, they even copied and pasted from the July meeting for finance ministers to the fall meeting with the summit leaders, and they literally just copied and pasted the text. Again, they're not even trying that hard. So let's start today, Kobus, to start thinking about what are some solutions. And let's be very clear here. There are people like Hannah Ryder from Development Reimagine, Vera Songwe from the United Nations, who have been putting out one solution and idea after another. None of them have really gained any traction, so we're going to try and contribute to that debate today. But, Kobus, it is depressing beyond imagination the fact that the wealthy world who owns much of this debt simply right now is not taking it seriously. Yeah, it's it's very, it's very troubling. Um, you know, adding to the issue is the, is the fact that this G20 initiative that that you discussed, um, you know, the, the, it it was essentially just a holiday on on repayments, which essentially just just kicked them down down the line. It you know, it wasn't it wasn't a a, re, a, a resolving of the debt of of these debt problems. It was simply a postponement of them. Um, on in in a in a broader context, it's also it raises a lot of questions about what China is going to be, what China's role is going to be in all of this. Because obviously China is a, is, is a very big and prominent lender. The last time we saw these kind of initiatives to, to, to resolve developing country debt, 
it was strongly led by Western-led institutions like the, the IMF and the World Bank. So it's going to be very interesting to see what new solutions are going to look like and what China's role is going to be in them. Let's just set the terms of our discussion today. So you've talked about some of the debt deferrals done by the G20. That was the Debt Service Suspension Initiative. We, you might hear the acronym today in our conversation, DSSI. Again, in my view, that was an unmitigated disaster. It was a failure on all fronts. A very little of the global debt was actually deferred. And as Cobus mentioned, it was only a deferral. It never went to restructuring the underlying principles. So countries just basically pushed off their payments, but they still owe all of that money. Then following the DSSI, there's something that came out called the Common Framework. This is supposed to be the, the magic formula that brings together private creditors, bilateral creditors, and the multilateral creditors. This has been around for six, seven months. I think it's been on the books, maybe even longer. It kicked in only as of January. And so far, all of a whopping three countries have participated in it because these countries are concerned that if they engage with the G20 on the common framework, they're going to get whacked by the ratings agencies. And that ratings agency downgrade could then force up the cost of their borrowing. So there's a lot of issues that are here. Let's talk about China very quickly before we get to our guest. Uh, China, again, there's been a lot of contentious issues on this, and we wrote the other day about this in the newsletter, and I put it up on Twitter, that everybody's pointing the finger at everybody else following the G20 finance ministers meeting in Jakarta that happened earlier this month. So the Americans came out very aggressive. Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, put the blame squarely on the Chinese. The Chinese turn around and say, it's not our fault. When it comes to the DSSI, we actually rescheduled more debt than any other country in the G20. And that is backed up by the facts. That is actually what has happened. The problem is, is that the perception is that the Chinese have not moved fast enough on debt restructuring because they're not cooperating, communicating, and collaborating with the other 19 members of the G20. So we have that point of contention. Meantime, South Africa is just, you know, your president, Kobus, he's screaming at the top of his lungs as the only African member of the G20 that something has got to be done, but nothing has been done so far. So let's now today talk about a possible solution. And for that conversation, I'm thrilled to have with us for the first time Ying Chen, who is a non-resident senior research fellow with the Global China Initiative at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. And he joins us on the line from Washington, D.C. A very good morning to you, Ying. Good morning, Eric. Ying, you and your colleague from the Global Development Policy Center, Yan Wang, who we've had on the show previously and really enjoyed a conversation with her, you co-wrote an article, Reflections on Sovereign Debt Restructuring in Low-Income Countries, and the Shanghai model. So let's talk about this thing called the Shanghai model. Can you just give us a very general introduction as to what it is, and then we're going to break it down and go into some of the details. Actually, the Shanghai model itself is a rather informal term. It's been mentioned by um, the research director of the People's Bank of China, the Central Bank of China. So by itself, it's a bit of a casual mentioning. But basically, the storyline goes back a little bit earlier. The storyline was part of the global solution for debt overhand, particularly in African countries. Um, me and my colleagues um, looking uh, looking at um, whether there's a possibility of using an old tool, an old model called the Brady Plan, or, or we call the Brady Bonds, basically used to resolve mostly Latin American debt problems in 1990s. Although the eventually the Brady Plan was expanded globally uh, to some 20 plus some countries. By then, there, there was a similar similar debt crisis, both basically to creditors from uh, official sources and also private sources. Then the treasurer of United States by the name Brady, he basically devised the, the, such a plan, basically collecting uh, non-performing loans from bilateral sources and private sources, uh, repackaging them as bonds, called Brady bonds. There, there were some technical details with the different uh, design, uh, different feature of the bonds, basically with some with the haircuts, some with the discounted interest rate, and basically refinanced the non-performing loans from the other countries. 
uh, from that mean there was a good release of the debt burden and putting those countries back to the basically sustainable path. And there, there were some good evidences of sort of recovering from, uh, for some of the countries, uh, recovering from that crisis. So me and my colleagues did the research and looking at the review of the performance of the plan, look at the technical details, and also look at the, some of the variations and proposals that we can use in today's world. For example, how to effectively use the new allocation of SDR, the special drawing rights from IMF, how to use some of the facilities from, for example, from the World Bank, from IMF, from other bilateral banks, including the common framework you, you mentioned earlier, so that uh, we can package some feasible transactions to help countries to recover. Basically, we, we call it the Brady Lake plan. And then um, after a bit of months or two after our paper was published or circulated, we saw there was a mentioning in one of the, um, say, workshop or conference in China, in Shanghai in particular. And, and the, this research director mentioned China has a, also a good interest in looking at body plan. He actually introduced the body plan in a meeting, but he offered some twist. The twist will be how to basically organize right, all the creditors and, and, and how to devise a single plan so that the, the bonds can be devised and issued. So he called it, the, oh, okay, let's, let's do a Shanghai club and basically organize all the creditors and let's call it um, the Brady bonds or, or, or plan to be a Shanghai plan, basically analogous to Brady plan. And one of the benefits he foresee was during the Brady times in the 1990s, uh, U.S. dollar-denominated global bonds uh, was you know, not not so so big, and av- after the plan, uh, you can see a mushrooming of issuance from developing countries. So he say, basically, he he wish that in this time around, if you do have similar plan, if you do issue bonds, for example, in RMB denominated, you may have a similar impact on the global debt market. And there may be a good introduction of RMB denominated global bonds. So that that was a, another benefit of using such a plan. So interesting. So just circling back to how the to how the Brady bonds actually work. You, you mentioned in, in in your your paper that they basically had to hit three three kind of goals. One is that they that it was debt relief in exchange for collectability. Um, then it was also it, it, they, it was debt relief, but it, it took policy reforms, um, and you know it it, won, it was a way of making the debt tradable. But you know, kind of you know, like from 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 non-performing loans into bonds that could be kind of bought and sold. So I wonder if you could if you could you know kind of for for a lay person audience if you could go into those three a little in a little bit more detail. Like how exactly was did the debt relief? Um, increase the collectability what kinds of of reforms were were imposed and and you know kind of how how did how did it make that the, 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 those loans more tradable <laughs> these are good questions the the very basically the rationale of using body bonds to basically as a very useful tool to resolve the debt crisis was like that uh, the three basic principles um, applied then will be probably going to be applied now. Now, the loan is called a non-performing uh, because the data countries will not be able to have sufficient cash flow to service the debt, either the interest payment or if we come to the final payments or principal, they, they are having difficulty. Now, usually when uh, one or two loans are having difficulty, usually the creditors basically, they invoke a something called the accelerator uh, basically they indicate in the countries in a, in a, in a default mode and they will recall all the loans uh, so it's basically ex- exaggerating and expanding all the crisis altogether so the country basically going to a down spiral of uh, yeah, that crisis per se so you do need to look at the solutions like earlier you, you two mentioned about the, the country is in crisis from that crisis to real economic crisis and also social basically people's li- livelihoods are now f- facing threats so uh, the solution generally is to stop that crisis into a down spiral by improving the debt service capability of the country uh, the way to do it is, uh, yeah, there's a so-called haircut, which is 
similar to hair, you know, hair cutting a real person. You're basically looking at the total debt overhand and basically trying to reduce the principles or the, or the debt payment, debt service burden for the country to the point that the country can service their debt. This is called basically step one of uh, debt restructuring. So you, 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 you will have some economists, accountant, and people going to the country and looking at the, all the details, looking at the income streams, looking at debt service outflows, and basically devise a plan. During the Brady plan time in 1990s, there are some so-called standard approach. So they essentially basically looking at the fundamentals of data and coming with a haircut amount, how much that burden has to be reduced. And then uh, basically they have two type of bonds to be basic, uh, to be e- issued on the market um, to basically raise new finance, right? And to repay the, the debt overhand back in the country after the haircut. The haircut basically applies to all the credit creditors. You, you uniformly, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're private sector or public sector. So everybody uh, accept an equal amount of haircut to avoid some conflicts or, or, or potential, um, basically, basically some creditors want to stay out from the whole process. So so they do need to organize everyone into the uniformity and accepting the same haircut. And then the technical detail was uh, there were two kinds of bonds. One, one is called the par bonds. Uh, essentially, is uh, to keep the same principal amount of the original debt, but with the lowered coupon rates of the bonds, so that the country's cash flow will be able to service the debt. At the same time, they usually to have another one to have a bit of a they call them a discount bond. So the principal of the bond is cut off. Uh, after the haircut, and then the interest rate of that bond is floating. You know, a lot of times people do see such bonds now. So the interest rate will be linked to, say, you know, the London Interbank, whatever rate plus plus is a spread based on the country's credit rating. Um, so that's this kind of standard approach. If you look at all the 20 countries during that time who issued the credit bonds, they almost everybody followed the same process. Same issue the two kind of bonds. They even follow the same coupon rates a lot of times. So that all sounds great. And the comparison to the Brady bond is very interesting because it's a model that we know. But when I was listening to the director of Financial Research Institute at the People's Bank of China and reading your assessment of it, that was from uh, Zhou Tongjun, and, and what he was saying in terms of building the Shanghai model influenced by the Brady bond, there was a disconnect for me because – really to draw comparisons to the Brady Bond is is like ancient history. It was done in the 1980s. It was done during the Cold War. But at that time, the Soviet Union was not a, a peer competitor in finance the way that China is today with the United States. It was done at a time when the United States had basically full control, unmitigated control of the IMF and the Bretton Woods institutions along with the Europeans. There was, there was, there was no debate or discussion there that it was very much U.S.-led uh, policy in that respect. So that was able to get done in a way that today seems unimaginable. And and I guess the part that I was having a difficult time is listening to Mr. Joe talk about this. I was thinking back to what the process is like right now in Zambia, where President Hishilema is trying to get all of the stakeholders together, creditors from the Eurobond holders to the Chinese, to the bilaterals, to the SOEs from the Chinese, to the multilaterals, And one of the big stumbling blocks that keeps coming up are the Chinese because of the lack of transparency. So on paper, this looks great. Sure, the Shanghai model, I love the idea. It really works great. But it doesn't work if there's an insistence on non-disclosure clause, which the Zambian coalition of 18 Chinese creditors has apparently insisted that they take a haircut. But you cannot tell anybody about our haircut, including the other creditors. So how does that work if so much of the Chinese lending practices and the restructuring practices depend on non-disclosure clauses that other creditors can't find out what the terms are? Could, could this work in that environment? A very good question. Uh, there are a lot of challenges are still there. Um, this is really a matter of uh, looking at the half glass full or half glass empty. Compared to the common practice before, I must argue that uh, the proposal of Shanghai model or other proposals seems to be more moving to the right direction, uh, basically to resolve the issue of 
uh, lack of transparency. So organization should through peer pressure and so other means, uh, you will probably see more transparency coming up from from Chinese side. From the you're saying from the Chinese side, like the China Exim Bank, China Development Bank, state owned enterprises, we should expect to see more transparency. Is what you're saying? Yes. Yes. What evidence do you have to support that? Because we're not seeing any of that, and I don't say that with any judgment on it. We're just not seeing any movement on the transparency side. Are you seeing something that we're not? No, no. You know, uh, as part of the research, we also face uh, sort of difficulties. Uh, although certainly you do have a lot of sources and trying to collect more information, more data, look, looking at the, all the details. But uh, certainly in terms of transparency, is a challenge. The transparency, a lot of times uh, people want to, you know, certainly in terms of com- comparison, whether you want to compare historically or, or, you, or you compare horizontally, right, to, to their peers. Uh, certainly the Chinese creditors tend to seemingly to have lack of transparency in a lot of places. But given that uh, there is a major expansion of chi- Chinese creditors going overseas, they are also in the process of learning. Um, they, you know, they probably brought some of the old-fashioned practices with with them to foreign con- foreign countries, but they are sort of facing the new tasks, new challenges, and new markets. Uh, so they are through the process. They are also learning. Uh, I'm I'm not to the defense of Chinese credit creditors or anything. It's just a basically a, a long process, um, and we have to bear in mind the Chinese financial sector is very state dominated compared to other economic sectors. It's slightly more old fashioned. They're still following, say, uh, government in instructions. They may have a lot interference from different level of government and so on and so forth. And um, many of the their so called uh, service clients are also related to state-owned sector side. So uh, they are sort of probably face less pressure from a ma- market or, or market forces, certainly back in China. But uh, going overseas, they, they will probably face more. Um, so I'm just saying for that process, they are learning. Uh, so Shanghai model certainly, in terms of uh, encouraging Chinese creditors and Chinese parties to the international norm is a good step. Now the market environment is very different, although we probably should not compare China to the old Soviet Union during that time. Uh, Soviet Union never was in such a situation that they are part of the global economy. That's right. That, that's exactly what I was saying, was that right, the Soviets right. were, were completely divorced from this economy, so the United States had basically the Correct. space to themselves. Whereas Correct. today they have to collaborate with a number of different actors, not even just different states, but bondholders and other bilaterals. So it's a much more complicated market today than it was in the 80s. It's a much, much more complicated market. Now the challenge is also, it's actually to my mind, I mean, what kind of a role or what, what kind of a, um, you know, being a player China wants to be. If you look at the Shanghai model proposals coming, China actually put into the U.S. shoes, uh, thinking that we're going to create a separate market, a global RMB market, for example, and then we're going to use the Shanghai model to drive it. Uh, that's one position, certainly. Uh, whether it's going to be a doable proposition or not, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, like you said, in the, by the end of the day, uh, every creditors, all the international agencies, all the sort of major donor countries and major creditors needs to cooperate. But in that process, I guess it's a learning process to be able to, to learn how, how to work together, right? Yeah, it's, it's, Really interesting. I mean, as, as, as you mentioned, one, you know, kind of one feature of, of the Brady bond model was this, this kind of imposition of, or, or call for, for reforms in, you know, kind of in, in, in the country that whose, you know, whose debt is being restructured. Do you foresee a similar kind of role coming out of, you know, in, in, in the Shanghai model where certain particular kind of reforms would then, would then be asked of, of these countries? I would imagine so. Maybe not in a very, um, very harsh degree to that matter. Although, if you look at the news and if you look at the speeches by the Chinese government uh, or ch- Chinese financial sector, they are, they try to differentiate th- themselves from other practitioners and saying, you know, we are more pro development. We are not really imposing uh, poli- policy, uh, you know, doctrines on developing countries. So we are together with the developing country, which is probably. True. So there, there are long times to cover less conditionality on other things, uh, rather than focus on loan by itself or infrastructure investments, so on so forth. But throughout the process, uh, there will be a convergence, I would say. China creditors will, will learn some of the basic elements of 
necessary conditions they wish to see on the market. So you are going to see some some requests from a country. Uh, they need to put their house in place and so on and so forth. But but I haven't sorry I haven't seen the details. I understand some research has done a lot of good research and looking at the details and what are the uh, policy and advice China would have. And, and in the long run, I actually must say something about the G20 you mentioned earlier. Uh, for this particular G- G20, the first uh, central bank governor and finance minister meeting in Jakarta, um, yes, uh, they actually spend a lot of time. So they, you know, even on the final communicate, I understand they, they work very hard and, and long time and, and couldn't have a major breakthrough. But one of the key points I under- understand is G20 also recognized their limitations, right? I mean, it's a collection of you know, ma- major economic powers, but uh, it is by the end of the day a collection. Uh, so they need to be, work on a consensus. So, but one of the consensus I would understand is everybody wish the leadership are coming out a little bit more strongly from, say, global institutions like IMF or World Bank. Um, so they wish these institutions, plus uh, you know their 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 brothers and sisters in on the regional level, the Asian Development Bank. To come to have a little bit more leadership, both on the policy side and on the financing side, and with their leadership, this is where it come from. The so-called conditionalities and best practices, international standards, can be introduced rather than being dictated by a certain country. You're you're very kind to them. I'm a lot less disrespectful of them because when they find the motivation to do something, all of that goes away, and we saw that in beautiful choreographed manner with the global corporate minimum tax, where they all signed off on a 15% global corporate minimum tax. And so it proves that when they're motivated, they can get things done. Mm. And I think when the debt restructuring, they're simply not motivated because there's no constituency in the United States right now that is pressuring Joe Biden to get something done on this. There's no constituency in London right now that's pressuring Boris Johnson to get something done on this. However, there was a constituency behind them on the corporate minimum tax. And so there's no motivation politically for them to do anything, so they just keep kicking the can. Sure, we can say that it's difficult, it's a consensus-based organization, but the House is on fire right now. Let's just be honest. The House is burning down, and they're not being able to talk. And if it's not the G20, then who? There is no other forum where China is a part of it because the Paris Club is not it. The IMF has not proven to be a venue for this. The IMF has been surprisingly passive in all of this. So if it's not the G20, then who would be the forum or where would be the forum that this would actually be done? It, it it is a challenge. Uh, actually, we, the other day we were thinking of doing a blog also on this point. Um, there are a lack of venues. Yes, G G twenty needs to pick up a little bit more through the G twenty forum. I think certainly on the China side, uh, China wish to call more forthcoming, say from IMF or World Bank. Uh, to have more leadership, but certainly, I mean, like you said, some somebody's shying away, so I suppose. But uh, uh, on the geopolitical level, I'm not 100% sure what's what's behind, uh, what's going on. But certainly, there there will be a lot of geopolitical forces at the play. Now, looking at the real world, uh, looking at the, uh, you know that crisis in Africa, I I 100% with you. The the crisis is there. The the fire is burning. Basically, history always repeats by itself. People probably didn't pay attention. Uh, sometimes earlier because they didn't feel the feel feel the burden, feel the pain. But immediately, sometimes they suddenly will realize the pain is there. So the the, the work had the has to be done. Um, this process I have seen in individual con- countries many times um, in my past work. Yes, collectively now I thank you guys trying to raise voice to, to many of your good work. I wish uh, you know global community would pay more attention. No. Last year, the DSSI, uh, other things, yes, kicked the can on the road a little bit further. And also because of a pandemic, also because of so-called the commodity price boom, they actually did inadvertently or fortunately giving the African countries or other sort of developing countries some uh, room to breathe. But now now we have more crisis, more pro- problems. And so probably the whole thing will explode very soon. Um, so I, I hope there, there will be con- concerted movements. Now, on the China side, I wouldn't say China didn't really know what's going on. 
giving a significant share that they, they already have their exposure in many countries. There are a lot of probably talk among them, themselves and, and uh, even on the individual cases, they try to work it out. But as, as I said, many times uh, the banks are subject to, to the constraints imposed by the regulators by the policymakers. So the, even within China, this new new entity on the global market, China itself has a lot of different factions you need to talk to, to have a coordination, to have a common f- platform. Uh, for that, they, they probably still need to work hard to find out how. You you mentioned in you know in your writing that that one of the effects of of the Brady Bond initiative was that it it led to this kind of mushrooming of dollar denominated bonds um, held by different countries and in, in in the process a kind of a it was kind of a form of internationalization of the of the currency and that similar kind of ideas of of internationalization of the RMB is is one of the factors playing into in, into the Shanghai model. I wonder if you could talk a little about that a little bit more, like what. What would the effect be, or like what kind of changes would we see if there is a, a an increase in in RMB denominated bonds kind of held by countries around the world? In your sort of a la- last part of the question, RMB denominated bonds to help other countries. Uh, certainly, in general terms, in theory, it, it would be good for country to have a choice, right? In in terms of that that portfolio, what what kind of currency denominated that they actually should have, uh, or other what what kind of that instrument they should have with the different features in order to match their economic structure. So I did mention in our working paper the optimal portfolio. Uh, many times the country, if you're only borrowing dollars in certain kind of bonds or, or debts or loans, you actually do suffer from certain risks, right? Some in, in interest mismatch, some maturity mismatch, currency mismatch, because some countries, uh, you know, they earn foreign currency, not only in dollars, but in some other currencies and so on and so forth. Now, given the Chinese economy getting bigger and getting more global, you do have countries uh, selling goods to China. Yes, a lot of uh, global market, they are still settled in dollars, but uh, China wish that uh, there will be an increasing share of RMB use for trade trade accounts, for 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 example, so that so the country will be able to earn RMB. Now, once they earn RMB, the RMB will have to put into some use, right? Uh, they can use it to service their debt. For for example, in in some scenario, for example, they use R they raise RMB debt, they use the proceeds to um, say buy products from China uh, for in- infrastructure development, for urban development. So there will be a sort of natural match on the currencies. I wouldn't say Chinese RMB is going to be a major currency in global market anytime soon, uh, but it's basically creating a new mix. So from the from a user point of view, it's definitely a good thing. On the, on the debt market per se, uh, the RMB global bonds, for example, this particular market. Yes, China has a motivation to see increasing shares of such market. Uh, but it, but in our paper, we did uh, mention there were a lot of more work needs to be done. Certainly, um, you know, RMB or Chinese currency is not capital convertible per se. I mean, the, China is moving to that direction, but it's going to take time. Um, so, if you do have an offshore RMB market, you need to remain offshore. So there will be a lot of special mechanisms put into place. Last question for you today, now, because we know you're very busy and want to let you get on with your day, is about whether or not this idea that Joe outlined at the China International Finance 30 Forum last year, last May, has any chance of actual success in the current environment. I know economists oftentimes like to talk about things in isolation of politics, but the reality is is that politics are everywhere today. And the world that we live in today is one where Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, right before the G20 and then right after the G20, is saying bad things about the Chinese. And then Zhao Lijian, the Chinese foreign ministry spokesman, turns around and says bad things about the Americans. And these two sides, frankly, for lack of a better word, hate each other right now. And so if this has any chance of success, you're going to have to get everybody to work together. And the idea of internationalizing the RMB is not something that's particularly in America's long-term interest, that they want to maintain the dollar as the supreme currency. And already there's insecurities in the United States that the RMB is chipping away at dollar dominance. So I'm just wondering, given the world that we live in today, it's a wonderful idea conceptually. Sure. Love it. 
uses a precedent that worked. If only we did X, Y, and Z. The Chinese are feeling their way across the river. They're learning. They're making mistakes, but they're putting forth new ideas. Awesome. But if the Chinese and Americans and increasingly the Chinese and Europeans don't see eye to eye on these things and the Chinese are reluctant to to be as fully transparent as other creditors want them to be, what kind of success or what kind of chance of success does an idea like the Shanghai model actually have in the real world for this current crisis? Um, yeah, this is a very much a soul-searching question. I, certainly, I, I have my views, but uh, I'm, it may not be correct. It may not be a reflection of the reality. But uh, but the generally, uh, my personal view is, like I said earlier, it's certainly moving to the uh, good direction. Uh, whether it has a probability of success, I would imagine so. Uh, the, you will see probably some transactions based on the mo- model, based on certain variation of the model. It may not be called the Shanghai model or Shanghai plan. Uh, it may be a small collection of different creditors because something, like you said, ha- it has to be done. Now, on the uh, overall sort of geopolitical thing, I mean, it's certainly, certainly beyond the e- e- economist perspective, but the, the overall goal will be to for every players in the new you know global environment trying to play a cooperative game, trying to find out equilibrium and trying to see how to generate the best benefits for everyone. But that process is so-called cooperative and repeated process. Uh, you can, from time to time, you, you, you see something flare up because people didn't see eye, eye to eye. Uh, there may be some misunderstanding, there may be some other things, but I think unless certain parties will have a basically a different ob- objective from what they're saying. But I think if everybody is uh, sort of uh, forthcoming with a good in- intention, they will find equ- equilibrium. It- it's going to be a process. You have more players now. I love your optimism. We don't get enough optimism today. So that is wonderful. The article is Reflections on Sovereign Debt Restructuring in Low-Income Countries and the Shanghai Model. I know, I know, it sounds geeky, wonky, and nerdy. But this is an important article for even non-economists to look at because we need to come up with these hybrid solutions and new ideas simply because the well is dry at the G20, the well is dry at the IMF and the World Bank. They're not doing anything. They haven't done anything. So wherever the ideas are coming from, it's important. And the Shanghai model is one very important contribution. And again, this article was written by Ying Chen and also Yan Wang, both from Boston University's Global Development Policy Center. Ying, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. It was fascinating to hear your insights on this. And uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Kobus. Kobus, it is so refreshing to hear a new idea in this space, anything that's new in this space. Because frankly, the space is bereft of ideas. Now, let me be very clear here. As I mentioned at the top of the show, people like Hannah Ryder at Development Reimagined, Vera Songwe, there are some great stuff coming out of the African Development Bank. There are a lot of ideas. They're just not getting traction. And they're not getting traction from the people that matter. In this case, that is the Americans, the Europeans, and the Chinese. And so to see ideas coming out of the Chinese side from people like Zhou Zhengquan at the People's Bank of China is absolutely critical because without buy-in from the Chinese, it's just never going to work. I am far less optimistic than Ying is, though, about the nature of Chinese involvement in this. I don't see any movement towards more transparency in Chinese debt restructuring or debt dealings. I mean, Zambia, of course, is the best case in point. I don't see any room for collaboration between the United States and China and among the key creditors. That doesn't seem to be playing out. And again, you and I only see what's publicly available. We have no insight into the actual conversations that are going on in places like Lusaka. We know that Lazard Frères, for example, the investment bank has been hired by the Zambian government to help facilitate the conversations among the various creditors. Some of the people you and I have spoken to have said, yes, there is a lot of discussion going on. It's a far more collaborative process than it looks on the outside. So that very well may be the case. But what we see on the outside is not encouraging at all. And I come back to the fact that the house is burning down. It's on fire. And these guys are dilly-dallying around, not Ying, the G20 folks, are dilly-dallying around, pretending like it's not that big of an issue. And when they're motivated, as they were with the corporate minimum tax, man, they got stuff done, fast. So, frankly, 
I'm not that optimistic. Yeah, no, I definitely, I, de- I definitely share your your kind of alarm about the the situation, and I'm also, uh, you know, somewhat pessimistic about about you know the 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 impact that that geopolitics is going to have on cooperation. I think it is definitely going to make it much harder to to between for, for the for the the Euro- the Americans, Europeans, and, and the Chinese to work together on these things, particularly because. You know, kind of like a, a lot of uh, like the 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 bonds and the bondholders are really you know kind of are really an important set of players. You know, kind of in 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 for example in in the Zambian case, and so there you would have to you, you would have to have some form of harmonization between you know between between kind of fiduciary law in in the US and 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 in the UK. And then you know whatever initiative the the Chinese are bringing, so you know so so the, that I, I foresee a lot of problems on that side. I do, however, think it is an interesting move that this that this that this discussion is happening in China. That you know that the Chinese are clearly you know kind of seeing that playing some kind of role, some kind of larger kind of coordinating role is a nat- is a natural step for them from, you know, fr- after becoming one of the world's most important bilateral lenders, you know, that you, you like you can see that that kind of logic leap happening. Um, and so therefore, I might not be as pessimistic about the, the transparency issue as you are, because, you know, like, as, as we see with China, you know, kind of they, 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 they set a, they set a kind of a, a policy of some kind, and then they kind of move forward with that policy for a while. And then at some stage, they are, they are capable of change, you know, kind of they, just because it's orthodoxy now doesn't mean it's always going to be orthodoxy. So I, I can, I can imagine that they may well, at some stage, be some kind of like direct from on high coming you know saying that now there, there has to be some kind of rethink of, of the kind of like blanket you know kind of opacity of, of Chinese lending um, you know I, I, I wouldn't be kind of falling over of surprise if, if, if they change kind of direction you know in order to make to make their kind of larger kind of global lending business work more efficiently um, you know but but you know for, for everyone to kind of work together to you know to, to, to set up this mechanism to decide who's going to be in this Shanghai club, you know, kind of overseeing mechanism group, you know, kind of that, that that's, that's an aspect of, of the model that we didn't get a chance to discuss with Ng, and I think that'll be very interesting, but to, to, to you know, kind of once, you know, if, if that kind of gets, starts, starts kind of moving forward, coordinating that movement with all of these other international lenders, particularly ones that are, that are very kind of you know, kind of inflected by by like U.S. geopolitical anxieties, I think is going to be a, a, a big challenge. In principle, I think you're right. Of course, the Chinese are capable of change, and they've had a very dynamic foreign policy in Africa, and I would say in many ways far more dynamic than the United States. But we're in officially the crazy political season. And the crazy political season this year is that coming up this fall, we've got the National Congress, the Communist Party National Congress coming up for... Uh, the Chinese side, which is going to presumably give Xi another five-year term, which he can then renew presumably again over and over again. And then we obviously are going into the election season in the United States. And I was just watching uh, Laura Ingram on Fox News, a segment that she went on for about seven minutes, railing on Biden for giving in to the Chinese over Ukraine and then even talking about the UN and the Saudi deal for buying oil in the UN. And there is just no oxygen in the room for either side to be working collaboratively together, which is what this requires in order to work, period. If these two cannot put down the guns for five minutes, it's not going to work. It just won't work because they'll be at each other's throats and every moment there's a concession that's made, the other will take advantage of it and exploit it. And Biden will be facing enormous pressure from his right flank and even potentially his left flank to not make these concessions to the Chinese. So I don't know where you go with that. I think, and again, we come back to the urgency of the matter right now. How do you reconcile the urgency with this idea that they're potentially capable one day possibly of making change? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, those are those are all great points. I think, I think the one the, the I think there might be a difference in time frames you know, here because you know obviously, you know one okay. The, so so the, the the Chinese system 
is going through changes, you know, and, and, and Xi Jinping's third term, you know, it's, it's difficult for us to say what exactly the kind of ramifications of that is, um, you know, on the, on the kind of wider Chinese system. But in general, the Chinese system is a lot more stable, right? Um, and, you know, that's the, that's the, 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 the plus size, of, the plus side of not being a democracy. Um, Let me, I, I think that depends on how you measure stability, of course. Let's remember that the Chinese spend more on domestic domestic security than they do on their military. So that that stability comes at a price and our instability Yes, but I mean I mean more in, in, in terms of in terms of policy stability. Sure, but democracy's instabilities are far more visible but may not be as deep. Maybe not in all cases. Yeah, no, I, I was I was being flippant about the democracy okay. thing. Is that it, you know it doesn't really reflect a you know kind of a heartfelt kind of belief on my side. What I meant more is that that the Chinese system has been has been quite stable in terms of um, in terms of their in terms of policy, but also in, in in certain ways in terms of their engagement with with African countries. Right. So so again, I keep quoting this book because it's so amazing. But like I'm reading I'm reading this uh, rereading this book um, by C. K. Lee called The Spectre of Global China, which just focusing this really deep dive on, on, on Chinese kind of engagement in Zambia's copper belt. Um, and one of the points that she makes is that because the Chinese have these kind of have a wider set of, 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 of priorities in a place like Zambia, so it's not only about making profit, right? Um, profit was definitely important, but it was also it was also kind of ensuring access to, to certain commodities, particular copper, and in and, and building political influence in you know in Africa generally and in Zambia particularly. So because they had this kind of wider range of 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 priorities there they ended up being a lot more beholden to the wishes of the Zambian government and other Zambian actors like like mining mining unions, for example. They had to play ball with these actors a lot more than international capital because she compares Chinese state-owned enterprises with international kind of construction and mining companies. And so when you know kind of when the when the copper price fell in you know kind of in, in, in Zambia due to these kind of commodity super cycles, the international mining companies simply fired Everyone and left, right? Um, when and then came back when 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 the, the the copper price rose again. Whereas the Chinese couldn't do that; they had to kind of stay on, and they had to then deal with with kind of wage negotiations. They had to deal with with kind of demands from the Zambian government. So they they are more stable and more adaptive, you know, kind of just by nature of of, of the way that they that they have to do business, and that is true for a lot of Chinese actors in in Africa, particular ones state owned or state linked kind of uh, you know kind of actors in, in in Africa. So so that's the reason why I think. You know, a there's more stability, but b they also have to take on board the the kind of complaints and the concerns of of global south players to a certain extent more than say the the, the bondholders, right? Kind of because because the, the, they're not they're, they're more exposed to the kind of political pressures on on the global south side. So so in that sense, you know, that makes me a little bit more optimistic that on the Chinese side there may be a, you know, some kind of way forward, some kind of innovation kind of going forward. What I'm a lot less optimistic about is the kind of global coordination of that, pulling in, the, you know, kind of, for example, the bondholders. So, you know, so, so there I'm, I'm still a little bit unsure about how that's going to work. But that's kind of the thing, isn't it? I mean, that is the thing because the bondholders want transparency on what the Chinese debt is, but if the Chinese are insisting on opacity as they apparently are then this doesn't work as we're seeing in zambia it just doesn't work and i don't know a way out of this at the same time it you know kind of those same bond bondholders are also then facing the dilemma of you know of are you are you gonna you know are, are you open to discussing some form of reform or some form of like a kind of rescheduling of some some other kind of like mechanism where you get a partial repayment or are you holding out for the full thing and then also risking losing everything no no but they've made it very clear that they are open to reform but only on the condition that everybody shows their cards if everybody doesn't show their cards they're saying we don't know we don't know if we're getting a fair deal or not. And so, so yes, I, I mean, the bondholders have said that they're willing to take a haircut, but they want to make sure that there's full visibility and transparency on the extent of the country's debt and among all creditors. 
So without that, it's a non-starter. And again, contrary to what Ying said, I haven't seen anything that indicates the Chinese are backing off of the transparency doctrine. Yeah, no, we, we haven't seen anything. So I think that the bondholders are right in some respects to say, listen, I'm not going to take the one that, to, to be the sucker at the table. And, and you saw how they played in Zambia last year on the, on, the, on, the, on the note when the Zambians did not force the Chinese to reveal the debts, whether or not they could or couldn't. The bondholders said, we'll take the loss. Yeah, there you, well, go. you know, we'll we'll see how it plays out. Um, you know, like the the other the other, of course, big danger is you know kind of facing everyone. Like, you, is is just a, a, a you know kind of a wave of defaults, you know, across across the global south, and that of course then kind of throws throws the global financial system into into crisis, and and everyone loses if that happens. You know, so so it may well you know who, let, let's see. I mean, it, it you know kind of the, maybe there is some form of kind of space for compromise. We'll have to see. Well, we have to see. We haven't seen it right now. It's something that we're obviously following very closely. Whenever these ideas come out from the people at the People's Bank of China, we do try and surface them into the discussion in our newsletter, on our website, and of course right here on the podcast. Everybody, before we go, I want to give a quick shout out to Jeronima, who is our francophone editor. He has just launched his own brand new podcast, Afrique Chine. Of course, it's only for French speakers, but it is a very cool podcast. He just published his first uh, episode, an interview with the Congolese nonprofit AfriWatch on uh, pollution among Chinese mining companies in the DRC. Go to Afrique Chine, and that's Afrique with a K A F R I K C H I N E dot com. You can go ahead and listen there, and you can subscribe on iTunes. So, again, if you speak French or if you want to learn French, this is a great way to learn French and practice your French. But also, we're really excited about now bringing some of the energy of our coverage that we've done in English now into the French-speaking space, and we're looking across the continent. He's got an amazing site at Projet Afrique Chine. I'll put links to that in our show notes as well. So again, just super cool. And Arabic is on the way coming after, we're probably going to wait Kobus until after Ramadan in uh, late April, early May for the launch of that, because everything in the Arab world just kind of slows down for the holidays that coming up in April. But keep your eye out for our new Arabic site that's out there. So lots of cool things going on here. And of course, our Patreon members, thank you so much to each and every one of our Patreon supporters. We are so grateful to you. We've enjoyed the private briefings, the group chats. Some of you are getting the swag. The mugs are now making their way around the world. And it's just, Kobus, I just love the fact that people are drinking their coffee in the morning out of a China Africa Project mug. That is just, to me, that makes me giggle to no end. So if you would like to be part of our Patreon community, uh, please go to patreon.com slash China Africa Project. We're going to start putting some new ideas into this community to do more than the briefings. And the weekly digest is what everybody gets as well at Patreon. And we just have this ongoing chat with all the folks at Patreon, and their support now makes this show possible. So thank you so much. Okay, let's leave it there. Kobus and I will be back again next week for another edition. Again, probably in April, we're going to start ramping up production again to go back to two times a week once we get through some of these launches. And we're really excited because there's just been so many topics we want to cover, but we've just been a tad busy with the launches. But that will be changed very, very soon. So until next week, for Kobus van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. For more information about the China Africa Project, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>